Talking enough. Dr. Dross tells me I never start on time, so I'm going to start on time. Uh, we want to recognize our business alumni. <laughs> so if you have if you have graduated from the School of Business here at Maranatha, could you just stand so we could recognize you? Wow. Great. We're glad you guys are all here. What we also like about this presentation is we get family members to come. So I know that Daniel Ackert's mom, Rosalind, is here. The Goldfusses, both mom and dad and grandma, are here, right? And, and, and. Oh, and a sister, right? We met at the coffee shop this morning. Yeah. And then, huh? And the, and the, I'm getting there. <laughs> And over here we have the future in-laws. Uh, and I have to tell you, every time one of these kids tell me they're getting married, my answer is, come on in the water. Yeah, think about that for a minute. Okay. And then I wanted to recognize the Sturwalls, who are here all the way from Ironwood. And they have had a tremendous influence on a young man by the name of Simon Guzman. So we're glad. And you didn't even know they were in town. <laughs> uh, I'm so glad, I'm so glad you guys are here. So let's have a word of prayer. This is bail dry. They don't have cookies for us today. And I really didn't want to eat their product. <laughs> so we're glad that you didn't bring anything. Let's pray. Lord, we're grateful for the day. We're grateful for these young people and for their effort. Thank you, Lord, for bringing them here, for the opportunity we've had to work with them and learn about them. And, Father, for the influence that they've had on our lives as well. Thank you, Lord, for your goodness. Thank you for the hard work that they put in this semester. We pray, Father, that you might calm their hearts. Lord, help them to present their business plan in a clear and logical way. Help us to ask them good questions. And, Father, might you be blessed and might you be glorified by what you hear today. And we'll praise you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. So, gentlemen, you're up. All right. Well, good morning, investors. We are Bail Dry. We're excited for the opportunity to partner with you in the uh, future of agricultural technology. At this time, our team is going to present to you uh, three main points. Number one, the problem. Next, our solution. And lastly, how we plan to make money. I am a hay farmer. I'm very passionate about the industry. And the better part of my life has been spent in agriculture. Uh, with the last 15 years of my life being spent specifically in the production of hay. Uh, hay harvest is one of the most important times of the year for hay growers and for farmers nationwide, and it comes around several times each year. Hay is a crucial and invaluable resource for agricultural production worldwide, and farmers dedicate thousands of hours into producing quality hay for their livestock. In the production of hay, the most important aspect is moisture content. If the moisture content of your hay is too high, hay loss is inevitable, either through mold or through combustion. And if the hay is baled too dry, uh, the hay lacks the vital nutrients needed for livestock to survive and stay healthy. So it is apparent that uh, testing hay moisture before baling is an absolute necessity for hay farmers. In addition, time is also an important factor for farmers, and it is a resource that is often in short supply. Unfortunately, current methods of moisture testing are very time-consuming and labor-intensive. I personally can recount days in which three to four hours of my workday were spent traveling field to field testing hay moisture to see if it was ready to bale. And that is four hours spent without making one quality bale of hay, four hours for which my employer paid me without making a profit for our company. And often we were still left guessing when the hay would finally reach optimal moisture content. This dilemma is one that is familiar to every hay farmer. The bale dry concept was born out of this dilemma. Our team is passionate about agriculture and has developed a product and a business plan that will provide maximum value to our customer. Our products will save farmers time by remotely monitoring hay moisture. Our products will save farmers money by lowering, lowering labor costs. And our products will increase efficiency 
by enabling predictive hay moisture forecasts. Next, our product consists of a remote hay moisture reader pictured here and a data analysis suite. The moisture sensing unit is constructed of three moisture sensing probes that detect the level of moisture content at, in the hay at any given time. Utilizing three probes per unit ensures a more accurate reading as it reports the average moisture content from those three re separate readings in that location. The remote probe can be set up as soon as the hay is cut or raked into rows. As the hay dries, the moisture probe does the work by monitoring hay moisture and reporting it to our app. The farmer is then free to utilize this time productively, being confident that our device will give him um, the necessary information and, and quality updates until the prime baling time. Bale Dry's data suite uses information harvested from each of its sensing units, combined with precipitation, wind, humidity, elevation, and geographic data to offer predictive insights and crop management solutions. This functionality will take the guesswork and lack of precision out of the baling process. Knowing precisely when their field is ready for baling, farmers will be able to manage their time and their workforce more effectively. Bale Dry brings together the best of moisture testing technology and cellular reporting technology. And at this time, I'd like Daniel Ackert, our Chief Financial Officer, to come forward and discuss our market. Bale Dry not only solves a problem for hay farmers, it makes money for us and for you as investors. So who are we selling to? Well, the United States is home to 460,000 hay farmers, and every year they harvest around 60 million acres of hay. Hay is used to feed America's 100 million head of cattle and its other livestock. So we're selling to a massive market that is crucial to the American economy. How do we plan to make money? Well, as Dylan referenced earlier, we're selling two products. First is the moisture sensor, and the second is a subscription service. So for a moisture sensor, we make a 5 to 7% profit on every sale depending on whether we sell it through a trade show, through a dealer, or online. Um, we plan to sell 120,000 units in our first five years, totaling $44 million. And that may sound like an ambitious or unrealistic forecast, but it's only 10% of our available market. For our subscription service, BillDry makes a profit each year that it sells over 3,000 subscriptions. We plan to reach 26,000 subscribers by year five, which is just 6% of all hay farmers. Our five-year sales for the subscription service total $8 million. Our company has spent significant time seeking to understand our future customers and how they make their purchasing decisions. So we've surveyed hay farmers, sat down with industry experts, and studied the marketing strategies of existing ag tech companies. The result is a marketing strategy that is uniquely fitted to the purchasing behavior of farmers. First, the Bale Dry team will target 20 trade shows annually to build awareness around our products and establish relationships with potential customers. The second method of market adoption is through partnerships with dealers and distributors. These include the large, nation, large nationwide brands like Tractor Supply and Farm and Fleet, as well as small local stores such as farming co-ops and feed stores. We've learned that many farmers are more likely to purchase new technology when they receive a recommendation from their local distributor. So Bale Dry will seek to cultivate strong, ongoing relationships with dealers so that dealers recommend our products to hay farmers. Egg equipment dealers will act as critical points of contact between Bale Dry and our customers. We also plan to construct a website on which hay farmers can learn about our products get in touch with us, and even purchase directly through a fully functional web store. By targeting these four channels, Bale Dry is confident that it will reach its customers and help them start saving money. At this time, our president, John Goldfuss, will speak about Bale Dry's competitive landscape. Now, who are the, Bale, now, who are the competitors <coughs> of Bale Dry, and what gives Bale Dry the competitive advantage over other ways of testing moisture content in hay. <coughs> this chart shows that the products of our competitors are either smart and time consuming or not smart and time consuming. <laughs> there is currently no solution on the market that is both smart and time saving. The twist test is a manual and inaccurate way of uh, 
method that requires farmers to visit every field and test the moisture content. On the other hand, companies like Agritronics and Delmhurst both produce high accuracy, smart moisture uh, reading sensors. However, these are time consuming as they require the farmer to go to each field and test the hay. Lastly, the Bale Dry Wireless Moisture Reader. Bale Dry is not only a highly accurate smart moisture reading device, but it also saves the hay farmer time because the farmer can look at the moisture content of all their hay in every field whenever and wherever they are, right from the palm of their hand. Next, I'd like to touch on the competitive advantages of Bale Dry. First, the Bale Dry Moisture Reader will be the first wireless and remote moisture sensor on the market. Next is the ease of use. The Bale Dry sensor allows the hay farmer to set up the sensor once and then monitor their moisture content through their phone. Third is the scalability of Bale Dry's moisture sensors, as multiple sensors will be able to be connected to the same app, thus giving the farmer, just giving, thus giving the farmer the ability to track the multiple fields at the same time. The connectivity of Bale Dry's moisture reader will be select will be second to none as it will be partnering with Sierra Wireless to support the moisture devices on many major cellular networks such as Verizon, AT&T, T-Mobile, and others. This will allow farmers, even in the most remote areas of the country, the ability to access their moisture readers from their smartphones. The Bale Drive design and brand is memorable and eye-catching, which will help it stand out from its competitors. Lastly is the affordable pricing of Bale Drive's moisture readers which allow hay farmers to buy multiple units for their farms. We have assembled a team that is second to none. As Dylan stated earlier, our team is passionate about the agricultural industry. Overall, our team has 69 years of agricultural experience. I, Jonathan Goldbus, will be the president of Bale Dry. I spent multiple summers around and on hay farms, as well as having four years of management experience. Next is Mr. Dylan Smith, who will be the operations manager. Dylan has spent 15 years on the hay farm and in the hay industry, thus making him indispensable to our team. Mr. Daniel Acker will be the Chief Financial Officer and has spent two years in finance at a Fortune 500 aerospace company. Mr. Simon Bootsma will be the IT and Human Resources Manager. Simon has spent 15 years working on a farm, including two years of management experience. John Taylor will be the Sales Manager and has spent 10 years ranching and has one year's one year experience as a sales representative. The experience of our team has helped us develop a great understanding of the needs of farmers, especially in the hay and forage industry. We are dedicated to the success of Bale Dry as our team realizes the potential of the wireless hay moisture reader market. Our moisture reader will help many farmers with their hay farming operations. And this is important to our team as hay farmers are not just our customers, they are our families, our friends, and our communities. Lastly, we are seeking five years worth of financing in which we will reach 10% of the available market share. We are seeking an investment of $500,000 in which you, the investors, would receive a 49% equity stake in our company. This, in this investment will be worthwhile as only reaching 10% of the market would equate to 120,000 moisture sensors sold and $2.8 million in profit, thus giving you, the investors, a 38% annual return on your investment. Bale Dry makes farming, hay farming easier and more efficient, and we'd love, to love for you to join us on our mission. So what do you say, investors? Are you bailing in or bailing out? <laughs> All right, good job. I neglected to introduce three gentlemen at the table. Chad Cape is the partner at ProCap down in Milwaukee area, an investing firm. David Schrader is the owner and CEO of Baker Rollman here in town. And Matt uh, Mothy is here from Markport Manor as the, the CEO. So, folks, you have questions for these young men. So, um, this technology does exist. I mean, how does what you're offering differ from Agritronics and what was the other one? Delmars. Yes. And why are uh, what makes you think that you can do this and not them, since they're already doing something similar? Well, we. As John pointed out in, in the one slide, um, there is no solution that is both smart and digital and time saving. It's the Why old. Not? The, the old. Well, the, the current motion centers they have on the market now 
There is no software that connects it with your phone, so there's no ability to be able to check it away from the farm. You have to be out there physically staking the sensor into the hay. You can, there's no, right now there's no ability to be able to check it like from the comfort of your own home or in the truck riding around. You have to be actually out there physically sticking the sensor into the hay bed. And um, just add to that, this techno technology is relatively new. Uh, we're using Internet of Things, which is has only been around for several years. So there are um, advances being made in other sectors of agriculture. Um, we think that perhaps hay has not been explored as much by the other egg tech companies because it's a smaller market. There's potentially more profits in corn or other um, areas of agriculture. So that's why hay hasn't seen massive gains in ag tech yet. So maybe there's a reason why they come and manually put the sensor in the hay. How are you going to ensure the security of something that you leave out in a field, especially if it's a high price item with red flags on top? Everyone, anyone can just go out and pick up all the red flags, right? <laughs> How are you ensuring security? What other, what's your response? So in talking with Dreamco Design, um, we thought, we were thinking about, you know, if we put this on the device, the farmer might forget, you know, where's my, where's my sensor? Um, so we talked with Dreamco and we asked him how difficult it would be to put GPS tracking into each of the devices uh, through your app. And he said, that's, that's no problem to do that all the time. It wouldn't take that, it's not that hard. And so that would be one way of, so the farmer could see where their moisture sensors are and then you can work with local authorities to find out where your sensor is um, using your phone and track down the person. I, I don't think that this is a high, high crime sort of thing. Yeah, it's... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm going to farm. Oh, I'm going to steal that for what purpose? So what's, what's the rate for one of these sensors? How many do I need for rate? So we're going to recommend one for every 50 acres. Yes, sir, and and that's just based on um, doing a little math, and also a, a guy that's going to use this is going to understand his field, he's going to understand his land, and and in my experience, usually when I'm manually testing hay, there's a spot there's a spot in the field that I'm going to that I know that's the last place that's going to dry, or that's like the problem spot. So um, it's it will take a guy that knows what he's doing, you know, but but we do recommend one for 58. So walk me through the process. I, I just bought one of your devices. What's the process that I'm going through to make that function? Well, and, and could you even start at the point of, because a lot of your sales are going to be trade sales. Sure. Could you use that as an example? I've just walked up to you. Congratulations. You're now the proud owner of one of these sensors. Can you kind of walk us through a uh, moment of purchase through the whole process? So if a, a, a farmer were to purchase at a trade show, it's an online order and then it's shipped back to his address, his or her address. Um, we don't carry inventory to the trade shows just because we're going to so many throughout the country and just the logistic issues that that presents. So we do the sale, process the transaction at the trade show, they'll receive the, their package, presumably a few days later. Um, and then first thing to do is download the Bail Dry app. From there, the app will give pretty basic and um, easy to understand instructions of how to connect the device. So each device has a unique um, SIM card in it, which allows the farmer to track where it is in the field and it's uniquely their um, device. And a farmer may have multiple ones of these, so it's important that the farmer connects um, each individual device through the app. And that will be pretty easy and basic just through um, either the scanning of a barcode or um, the other technologies that are out there. The um, QR scan is something that we're also looking into. But either way, there will be a process to scan in the unique um, device, and then from there it just connects to the app. What's the average size of a, of a hay farmer operation, and how many typically do you see them buy in their initial purchase? I know that. Um, so, I mean, the range of a hay farm really, it really depends. Uh, you'll have guys that they have a 25 to 50 acre field and they have one of those. And then you have guys out in Colorado, Arizona that have thousands and thousands and thousands of acres of hay fields and farms just stretch as far as you can see. So it really depends on um, the farmer and the geographic location as well. Um, what's the second part of the question? I'm sorry. Yeah, just how many 
the size of their farms and how many do you anticipate them buying yeah. initially? Yeah, so farmers like to try things out. No, um, all of us growing up, we all know a lot of farmers, and they like to, they're not just going to jump heads in by, oh, I'm about 25 of these. You know, they're going to test it out. They're going to try it out first. And so we anticipate selling one to two of them to a farmer and demonstrating a lot of those as well. And then once they figure out, wow, this is nice, it saves me time, then they'll have the option to purchase more through our, through our online or through a dealer. So you mentioned one to two, right? So you're going to demo this to farmers, and, and then they're going to decide. And I think the question is going to be really aimed at Mr. Taylor as the, uh, the sales manager. And if they're only buying one to two, they're trying it out first, how do you explain the $2 million in trade show sales in your first quarter? Uh, well, yeah, uh, like a hobby farmer who has 25 to 50 acres and only need one to two of these. But a, co a company known as Like Brothers in Florida, they have 200,000 acres of, of hay farming. So they would they would obviously need a lot more than one or two, but we uh, that is a good point. But that, that's in the end. Yes, sir. That is a good point, and then maybe our first quarter may be a little high. So, but I would Maybe also, a little I, high? I, so I, you, you, you like... I forget the number, but in your first year you have, I think it's seven, and then you, you don't have for four more years, it takes four more years to get the next seven or eight thousand or, you know, I, I forget which, which uh, unit that was. But Well, you see some seasonality in the, in the sales numbers because of just the hay market in general. But, so farmers gear up for the hay season by purchasing. Sure. So we've anticipated that in the Q1. Do you have any customers currently? So, so you don't you have, you have a beta prototype? No. We'll you achieve that in, long in the did. startup period. We will, and I would remind you that this, the trade show sales <coughs> are only three percent of the customers that we of all the um, attendees that we engage with. So we talked with um, sales representatives that work in ag tech and go to trade shows, and said, "What's a good conversion rate? What should be our percentage here for our sales?" And um, my, my person that I talked to said, not above 5%. So we went two percentages lower and we went for 3% of all the attendees that we engage with. So, so you had 15,000 units sold the first year and you don't get another 15,000 sales until year five. So, so the question is, from a, from a product or customer development perspective, if you've ever looked at Stephen Blank, he talks about customer discovery and you validate customers, mm -hmm. and you create customers, finally you build the company. So it's, it seems there's, there's a little concern that you guys are trying to build a company before you even validate that you, you have a customer in, in the product cycle for development. You know, a software person, it just doesn't happen in a week. You know, it, it takes six months maybe to, to get feedback from, from your customers before you can make a change to, to, to validate that you really have a customer and you can start to create customers. So sure. the question is, why are you spending, why do you have a marketing and sales guy uh, getting twenty-five or $50,000 of, of salary before you even have a customer? It, does it make sense to, to, to try and market something you haven't proved the market wants? I guess is the question. I think that's something that we will definitely be working on in our six month startup period. A lot of the well, but the problem is if you're paying someone fifty thousand dollars a year and you have five hundred thousand dollars of startup capital raised, and there's five of you, it just your startup capital disappears very quickly. So the question is, is there a way to defer uh, your startup expenses until you verify and validate what the customer really wants? Because otherwise, you may have a great thing, but problem if you run out of money before validating what the customer Absolutely. really wants. On um, a related note, um, I guess kind of tied to that, uh, I think we're probably curious to kind of understand the more of the details of this partner that you're working with to really do the development, the design, the production, and um, you know, kind of a timeline uh, as you've talked with them. How long does it take to build a prototype, to test it, to market, try it out first, and you know, kind of, can you kind of swap us through that timeline? Maybe John could take that, but just to, to your point about the deferring some of the costs, two things that we did is, first of all, um, none of our team makes the, so there's, in terms of benefits legally required and then the additional benefits, none of those kick in until year one, so during that six-month startup period, that's an expense that we won't incur. 
um, to your point. And then also, we build up our sales team in year two. And year two is where we bring on our highest paid sales rep, um, just because like you said, we don't wanna um, kind of be bogged down by a lot of salaries expense right away in year one before the sales start to come in. Um, and then, John, do you wanna take the yeah, um, you're talking about custom technology. Custom technology is about the manufacturing process right. and the R and D. Yeah, absolutely. So, we had very close correspondence with Miss Ellen Mel. She's the CEO uh, and president of Custom Technologies, and she talked to us a lot through. She's worked on some similar projects um, that involved wireless technology. So the, they have a lot of experience with that, uh, with wireless, you know, implementation into different products. So she was able to kind of give us a little bit of a timeline, um, and we estimated based on the feedback that she gave us about six months um, for, uh, for <coughs> researching it, uh, building it, testing it, and then going to market on January 1st. Is that where the 260,000 in year one comes or in the uh, startup? Is that 260 all paid to um, that companies uh, for their development of your product? <coughs> You know, product development is 260 in the startup. Is that right. predominantly That's where the money's going is to that one company? That is custom technology. Okay. Yes. And then what about the uh, other half of it as far as the uh, the uh, app development? Yeah. So you want to talk about the app development? Yeah, so the app development is with Drinko Design, and they're actually going to be working on connecting it through a SIM that will be provided by Sierra Wireless. And this SIM is actually going to be embedded into the physical product, and it will actually allow connectivity not just to like one cellular company like Verizon. It will actually be available for every company there. It will have like the ability to connect to it. And with the app, um, Dreamco is designing it, and then they're going to pass that on to us. And then we're actually going to have a <coughs> excuse me. We're actually going to have a software engineer that's going to update it and keep it in track and everything. He'll receive directions on how to do that from. So, so where's the cost of the app development? That's in startup costs under. Um, is that part of the two hundred and sixty? The yeah, no, nope, there's 30. an additional line item for application development. Okay. Thirty thousand. And that's to the Dreamco company. Correct. Right. Now, what about the? Uh, is every of one of your farmers downloads that app? They're gonna have to. Somebody's gonna have to pay for that. It's gonna have to be hosted by like on Apple Store and all that, where, where's the cost that are associated with all that? We have a, I guess that's something we can add, um, and thank you for pointing that out. The app hosting fee is not gonna be a significant cost, we don't think. It's definitely something that we can incorporate into our financials. Um, and obviously there's, were you gonna point something out? Yeah, it's, it's not that big of a cost. What about your, your subscription going from like thirty percent to fifty or sixty percent in the following years? Why wouldn't you require? Why wouldn't the farmers want to start with, with a subscription one hundred percent? When you buy the unit, you have to get the subscription to have this other data as well, which might tail off, which is more typically what you see as opposed to initial subscription and then subscription ramping up. So you're you're suggesting a a business plan where we make the we just include it as a one-time cost and then they get the online the, the ongoing subscription no, there's a there's a the, the purchase price for the unit and then a mandatory subscription that follows and then maybe you have to buy it for two or three years and then hopefully they renew after two or three years then maybe not so they have some paper off but generally you see that more often than i like in yeah afterwards. i like that idea that it might build up some of our revenue for the subscription. I think just the idea that um, for the subscription is to incorporate some sort of recurring revenue um, because we've got that one-time purchase and then after that we don't see the customer again until they presumably get Gen 2 or something um, or they need to buy more units. So we wanted the subscription so that every year we have a recurring revenue. That's, that's a good idea and it's something that we can um, investigate further. So on page 7 of your document you tell us that you've issued a survey to over 35,000 hay farmers. So what kind of results have you gotten back from your survey? Yeah, I can speak to that. Um, so the, there was a, or a group on Facebook called Hay Kings. Um, there's 35, over 35,000 members now, I believe it's 37. And it just keeps growing. 
And it's basically um, a bunch of hay farmers and they're sharing ideas and looking at things. And so we put a, a survey on there asking them, you know, we didn't go into a lot of details about the products. We didn't want to, because since, since we do not have a patent yet, we wanted to make sure we're not releasing a lot, but we kind of gave them the basic concept of it. Uh, what, um, and we asked them, would that be something you would invest in for, you know, X amount of dollars? And overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly it was, yes, that would be great. And a lot of the comments under the, uh, the survey data were um, like kind of asking what it is, and other people would say, oh, it sounds like something with moisture reading, which is definitely what we need right now with all the rain that we've been having. And so there was definitely a lot of positive feedback from everybody who took that survey. So I'm curious why you didn't include any of that information. Mm -hmm. that, that answered a lot of our questions. Along that same point, I see that you came up with the $350 per unit based off of the cost to uh, build it with uh, your uh, outsourced entity. And then that includes $25, uh, which is less than 10% for your pocketbooks. If you're selling it at a discount, which you would have to for a distributor or any other retailer, I don't know if that's built in. But from that same survey, what's the value proposition for the farmers? That you're going to you're going to sell it at 350, but is it really going to save me for the one of you who is driving around the fields and what you are getting paid? If you're only getting paid ten dollars an hour, that's thirty-five dollars of driving around the fields. Is it is it worth the three hundred fifty dollars a piece, uh, whether you're managing fifty acres or ten thousand acres? And um, what's your feedback on that? And, and to answer Mr. Schrader's question, could you kind of even go a step further with it? And, and let's just say that I'm a farmer and you're approaching me to convince me to sell buy this. Can you kind of explain to me a re return on my investment? Sure. I'm about ready to shell out 350. Tell me what I'm going to get in return for it. So if you kind of answer yeah. both those questions together. Yeah, so absolutely. So with the uh, the moisture reader. Um, so like Dylan said, you know, his boss was paying him $15 an hour to drive around for four hours for days where he, they weren't bailing hay, and he had to do that a couple times per cutting. He says four hours of him making $15 an hour, and then there's three to four cuttings per year of hay, depending on location. Sometimes it's year-round, like in places such as Arizona or Southern California where Simon's from, it's year-round hay. So that's four hours every cutting. Um, at, at least where that person you're paying that person has labor costs where they could be doing something else and you can't put a really put a monetary value on that time they could be doing something else like sure. working on their so tractors. Yeah, four and times 15 is 60 mm -hmm. times 3 is 180. Right. So now we're at the 350. Where else is the value? Yeah, I mean the value is you know the time they can spend doing other things that can be more profitable for them. Instead of taking that four hours and going out and checking hay that's not ready to bail, they can use that for some other business. So, so what's, what's, what's the cost of the bale of hay? And, and, and how often does the hay get ruined because it's too wet or too dry? And or what, how does the price change if the hay bale is too wet or too dry? That's the second element of the value proposition that Mr. Schrader's alluding to. Do you have an answer to that? Yeah, so usually, I mean, hay fluctuates. Like in Texas, they had a huge drought this year, so hay, Hay in Texas goes skyrockets, and so that's a like that's 10X, a X, wasn't it? What's that? Ten times the so, Yeah, yes, sir. So that's an extremely variable cost. And if I can speak back to the the value, the fact that the hay hay cuttings happen for us in Colorado, we can get four to five cuttings a year. So you're saving that time four to five times each each season, which which will add up. What's the life of a sensor? How long do they last before they have to be replaced? I, John. Yeah, it's something that we're, you know, we're have to figure out with custom technologies because we haven't engineered the product yet. Um, but you know, as far as like weatherproofing and stuff, that's not a problem. Um, but you know, there 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 will be um, parts on it that can definitely break. You know, the moisture sensor probes. You know, somebody hits it with their tractor, breaks. You know, so. Um, as far as like if you're just using it every day like it's properly supposed to, um, we don't have a specific time yet because uh, we just haven't engineered the product and tested it yet. So we, we can't really speak to the life of the product yet. Um, but that sounds like there's a lot of variables that we don't even know yet, and, and yet we've got a pretty finite six month period of time to do all that. So I'm kind of concerned that six months might be a little tight. Uh, what's the length of the battery uh, life on that? Um, the battery life can honestly be 10 years. Um, so the thing that the battery would be used for is obviously um, testing the hay, which uses, uses an electronic impulse. Um, the other main uh, activity that it has to do is send a signal over the 
cellular network. So the network is called a um, low power wide area network, um, specifically made for these Internet of Things devices to use a, a tiny, tiny amount of battery. Um, and in that manner, the battery can last for an incredibly long time. Is the, is the device sending a signal 24 seven then? It's gonna be at intervals or um, we could also make it so that it's whenever the customer seeks it. So based on the app, when he requests a reading, um, send a signal back to the device. So it can be a two way or we can just do it. It, it probably won't be real time because that would just um, be a constant flow of energy through the probes. It's not efficient. So the probe tells me it's time to pick up the hay, to bale the hay. Do I go collect the device and put it away? What do I do? Well, you would just simply take it up and put it in some storage unit. So I still have to walk out into the field before Well, I you'll, be, you'll be driving your tractor yes. along, and then you'll see it with the big orange flag, and then you can stop <laughs> and pick it up. <laughs> <laughs> hey, but they drive over it. That's, that's more that's increased that's increase sales. <laughs> <laughs> I've got a question. Um, Mr. Bootsma, you're the IT manager, is that correct? And then Mr. Smith, you're the operations manager. Yes, On page 7, it says that Bail Drive will employ a dedicated operations manager and IT manager to work alongside custom technologies. Is that both of you working with these three? And what are you doing on a regular basis with these three organizations? So my primary role with custom technologies, number one, would be quality assurance. I think that's some place that the operations manager um, can have a lot of influence. What does that mean? I'm sorry. I, I asked questions and cut you off right away. <laughs> but what does that mean? I didn't see a lot of comment on quality sure. assurance. And what do you do? What sort of support do you provide post sale? Post sale, okay. we're we we're all available for for customer service. Uh, just as a startup, you know, we obviously can't employ a call center or anything, but we are. Uh, we we will implement number one uh, customer service through our app platform. So we'll have, you know, frequently asked questions or s something of that nature. Um, and then as far as my role within custom tech would be um, working closely with, with our engineers that are employed to make sure our product is functional, quality is being maintained, and all of that. Wouldn't that be the IT guys? Well, Mr. Bootsma, what will you, I mean, are you, who's doing it? Who's actually working with these yeah. companies? And why is our $125,000 software engineer if you've hired someone else to do the work? The software engineer? Or do you want to take that? Yeah. yeah. Well, I was just going to say that the IT manager, I'm actually working above the software engineer and the data scientist. Um, so I don't really have much involved with IT other than that. Um, I'm not sure what he was going to say about the software engineer, to be honest. but. Um, I just know that the software engineer, he's actually going to be keeping a lot of records of the product, like what's going on with it, and you know, customer feedback, he will end up hearing a lot of that, so he can plan to make changes with custom technologies as needed. So, yeah, um, the software engineer does two things. Like he said, keep the app running smoothly, make it increasingly better, and that includes getting customer feedback, um, running patches, things like that. Additionally, um, we're running this data analytics subscription service. So we have a data scientist who's doing kind of all the back end work, the analyzing, the engineering of um, the <coughs> analytics. And then we need to distill all that into something that's easy for our customer. They don't need to see all the algorithms and everything. So that's where the software engineer comes in, um, working together with the data scientist to build out all that into a useful app. Have you ever met any data scientists or software engineers? Um, our, our, our source for that is Tiffany Kelly. She works, um, she used to work at ESPN. Yeah, so, um, so right. I, I was, it was a snarky question. The fact of the matter is they tend to be pretty introverted. They love computers and they don't really want to talk to people. Um, so you're, you're talking more about a product manager, I think, which and then it starts to be the CEO, CEO, product president at the end of the day. Product managers need to talk to customers and get feedback and engage them. Not oftentimes, somewhat, sometimes a data scientist is really excited about doing it. Um, but uh, you, you talk about sales. I thought I saw commissions, massive commissions. Mr. Schrader, do you, do you compensate your sales guys with 0.5% and 1% commissions? <laughs> or do you find they are incentivized more by something in the 5, 10, or, 
or more percent range? Five to ten. Five to ten. Well, where do the 0.5 percent and one percent sales commissions come from? So that 0.5 percent is actually based on every sale that is made, whether it's the sale that he himself is making or one that one of the sales representatives is making. He is making 0.5 percent commission on each of those sales. But the sales reps are only making what is it? One percent. So, that, I mean, when the that? market has people making 10 or 15 percent work for Mr. Schrader, why would they want to come to work for you if they're only getting 0.5 or 1 percent? They do have a, a um, guaranteed salary in addition to the uh, commission, and their effective salaries are right on par with the rest of the market. In fact, just, uh, what is the commission that uh, Mr. Tate's referring to, the commissions of the uh, distributors? So if you're at Mid-State Equipment and they're going to sell one of these units off of their shelf and you have a 350 list price with only $25 of margin in it, what's going to be in it for him? i, I got to believe it's going to be at least 10% cheaper than list. So if it's advertised on your website at 350 and it's advertised on their shelf at 350 he's going to want it to buy from you for no more than 300 uh, Ballpark. So if he's already cutting into any margin you had in there, less than 25, you had more in there for margin besides development costs. So we dropped down the, the sales price to distributors. Um, but, how, but you can't go very low. You only have $25 of profit built in, if I'm understanding your your uh, costs of goods properly. So we still make 5% on the sales to distributors, and then we were thinking that distributors would increase the price of theirs. Um, a lot of times I was thinking that products through distributor cost more. Okay. That, um, that's not a problem, but you also mentioned you're going to sell it on your website, so then you're going to have two different prices, and that's going to be a problem. So you better have only one price, and your website better refer them to distributors, because if you have a list price there, and then your distributor is selling for 15% more, that's okay. going to irritate somebody. Sure. Uh, okay. So I got a question for Mr. Taylor. What, what is it, who is your critical customer that if you don't reach these people, none of this makes any sense? So our critical customer, we have two different sources of uh, ben vendor avenues. We have large corporations such as Farm and Fleet and Tractor Supply. Is that is that the twelve target large uh, twelve large chains to which you refer to on page fifteen? Yes, sir. And we're also going for you know your local feed store like Sebring, Florida, where I come from. There's a feed store called Glisten's Animal Supply. It's been around for 40, 50 years. I remember going there when I was a little kid. Really family oriented shop. So we're, we're going for the small place and we're going for the large. How do you get into the large place? Well, we do know someone on the board of directors for Tractor Supply. Her name is Edna Morris. And hopefully some Tractor Supply is the largest agricultural corporation out there. Once we get a foot in the door of that company, hopefully since we're already working with a large company, it will be able to go into the smaller companies such as Farmer Fleet. There's only 65 Farmer Fleets in all of America and there's 1,700 Tractor Supplies. So if we're working with Tractor Supply, the other companies should see the, the value in our product. Uh, can you talk us through the process that's involved in getting something onto a shelf at a local farm and fleet? So um, we um, we talked to the, a gentleman at Mid-State Equipment in Watertown. He's a small distributor, and he walked us through his process. So, uh, How many stores does Mid-State? Um, I think they have four in the, the region in the state. Okay, all right. So he talked us through the process. Basically, you, the sales rep will meet with someone on the, um, their acquisition team. Um, it, it goes in front of, uh, so you, we walk them through the product, what it does, and then it goes in front of a panel. They kind of decide quarterly or um, bi-yearly or something like that. Uh, obviously, it varies in different stores. Mm -hmm. And then um, they make a decision on whether to carry it or not. So what I find interesting about your proposal is that everything is being outsourced to somebody else, all the intelligence of the business. So you're basically asking us to invest a half a million dollars in a sales team. Well, why would we do that? We are insourcing a lot. We're insourcing um, all our sales. We're insourcing your the development team. of the subscription service, which is an entire piece of our company. Which is a sales activity. We're creating a product for that. We're creating a unique, um, predictive analytics platform. Uh, that's all in-house. And um, so who on the team has that capability to develop, develop that platform? We're hired. Isn't that the data so scientist? Yeah, the software engineer. So you outsourced it. So you are still hiring, basically investing half a million dollars in a sales team. Furthermore, on page 10 it says, 
In future years, the company's cash balance approaches weighty levels, management may choose to release some of the cash balance through investing activities. I'm not going to return it to say to you, the investor. They're going to make their own investment decisions in other things because it says management would choose investments based on the company's risk tolerance and desired time horizon. So the question is, are you guys becoming Warren Buffett? Or are you guys going to just be bill drive? Because I think Mr. Board and I are looking for an investment in a team that's focused on doing an agricultural thing, not investing in other deals. There's a company in Madison called Understory. It's an Internet of Things shop that has developed a, a device to sense hail. They've been raising money and they've been developing that since 2013. Six years, millions of dollars. And you guys are going to make a ton of cash and have 15,000 sales in your first year or whatever. Um, and then use your cash, not to return to us, but make more more about the like decisions for us, which is, is well, audible. The point of that was we have a high cash balance and we don't want to um, kind of sink a lot of money into it. We don't want to retain this high cash balance. So if you have a high cash balance, do you think you'll draw competition? And once, once you're so successful, do you think, uh, uh, I mean, it probably is wise to start out with a low profit margin to begin with, uh, as you, just to get your foot in the door, but as you grow to be more productive, unless your patent's really good, you probably get more competition. The cash balance might not be quite as high as fast as you might think it Correct. might be. Correct. And things we plan to do with our cash besides become Warren Buffett is, one, pay, pay our investors back. Um, two, we have a, a very large cost of goods sale, sold um, expense every year, so just to remain liquid, um, we need to carry a lot of cash. Three, um, like Mr. Board referenced, a lot of our stuff is done outside or outsourced. Um, beyond year five, we're, we're curious about the possibilities of bringing some of that in, in house. So um, the reason we, are, we do have to outsource is because our startup costs are already so high, we can't manufacture this buy all the equipment needed to do that. We can't keep a, a manufacturing team employed, keep a warehouse. Um, so we're doing the what we can as a startup with limited capital up front. Uh, beyond year five, with that cash balance, um, it's still there. We'd like to bring some things in-house. You can get on three minutes. Sure. Okay. Well, I, had, I, I noticed on page 25, you also talk about adding downstream additional engineers and uh, so to Mr. Gore's point it's those are going to be contract for you. So it seems like it goes counter to your insource but in fact the plan is to outsource even additional support. Um, I, I just had a question too on the on the PTO on your benefit statements. Um, it, it seemed like it was relatively rich beginning in year one for time off uh, to the point where you add all the buckets of You want to just talk about our source? I mean, yeah. for the, yeah. So there are like a list of required ones for every business, and that includes Social Security, Medicare, federal unemployment, et cetera. But we also included some that are not inquired, like required, and these, like the rates we found, percentages, were actually found on the Bureau of Labor Statistics, and they provided like a list of the average. Um, so those are just averages based off what we found as labor statistics. Yeah. So, so perhaps to the earlier point about minimizing those startup costs, that might be a benefit expense that is near the health spend that can be reduced in your long. Good point. I'm also curious on that note, if your annual salary, because it looked like everybody's salary, does that amount on top of their annual salary? So if you take time off of your sick or personal days off, is that a paid amount above their normal annual salary? Or is it a subset of their annual salary? Yeah, this, it breaks down to about 70, 30, I think, or, se or something similar to that, plus or minus a couple percentages. But the salary is going to be, for us, $40,000, benefits on top of that. Okay. So, okay. so the question is, I can take it, I can take time off and increase my salary. Because I get my base salary plus, plus, yeah. plus the time off. Well, 
that's how it shows up in the financials because we have to book that expense, but they don't pocket the money. Mr. Schrader, do you have one more? Just one more. Um, what happens when you don't achieve year one until year five? What happens if you don't achieve year one until year five? What we would do is we would seek outside funding. We would know pretty soon by about that March 1st of year one whether or not we need to do an additional round. So if we did a Series B round of funding, we're in St. Louis, which is the egg tech capital of the world. There's a lot of agriculture um, startups and incubators, and we are fairly confident that having sales at that point, um, we would have at least a little bit of time today in getting investment. Thank you.